Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for, for wasting just a minute there. Um, my name is Kate Proctor, I'm the political editor of um, The House Magazine and Politics Home. Thank you very much for coming along to this fringe today. So this is the bright blue think tank and Poverty to Solutions um, joint event and we've got a really, really great panel today. Um, so as you'll have seen, this is <coughs> leaving no one behind, the people's voice in levelling up. Um, and I was asked to chair quite a few events, um, and they all sounded so boring, apart from this one, which I thought sounded a very important topic, and I'm really glad it's been discussed at um, Conservative Party Conference. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, if you would like to tweet um, about any of the content or anything that's being discussed in this today, could you please use the hashtags bright blue and the hashtag CPC21? And if you want to use any of the Twitter handles, it is at wearebrightblue and at poverty to souls. I hope I've said that correctly. Um, so, I mean, if I'll just introduce you to the panel um, and then we'll talk about some of the topics that um, we're going to be discussing today. So, we have Toby at the end here, Toby Lloyd, um, chair of the No Place Left Behind Commission, and he is a former number 10 advisor on housing. Ryan Shorthouse, he's the, the founder and chief executive of Bright Blue. And we have Christian Wakeford, MP, um, MP for Bury South, and a member of the Education Select Committee, and a member of the Northern Research Group. Um, moving further down, we have Tracy, Tracy Harrington, is that right? A manager um, and an expert with lived experience at Thrive Teesside. Thank you for joining us. And Karina Eastwood, a community organiser at Thrive Teesside. And Karina is a member of Poverty to Solutions as well. So some of the topics that we'll be discussing um, later on today, whilst after we've heard the panel do their, uh, their introductory remarks, we're going to be talking about um, what levelling up means um, for left, so-called left-behind communities. Um, should levelling up place greater focus on addressing poverty and deprivation as opposed to some of the other indicators that the government uh, discusses? <coughs> Um, could the government's levelling up agenda be better informed um, through involving people with lived experience in policy making? Um, and what is the best way to employ the knowledge of people with lived experience to address issues such as debt and poor quality work? Um, so there's plenty to discuss. Um, one more thing that I need to tell you all about Bright Blue. <laughs> um, so Bright Blue, uh, for those who don't know, is an independent think tank and a pressure group for liberal conservatism. Its seven major research themes are a bountiful economy, clean environment, good lives, rewarding work, <coughs> empowering government, just institutions and connected communities. And thank you very much to uh, Brightly for hosting all of this today uh, with, uh, with your partner, Poverty to Solutions. So we're going to hear from each of the panelists for five minutes with their um, opening remarks. And I wondered if we could go to Toby first, if that's OK, sure. if you're ready to go. Sure. OK. okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, the No Place Left Behind Commission is an independent policy commission that spent the last year kind of looking at these questions of levelling up and left behind places. I won't go into huge detail of the, of the lengthy discussions about the definitions of these terms. Suffice so, um, in the end, we decided not to bother too much with too precise a definition because it doesn't really help the debate anyway. But I do think it's worth at least flagging that uh, left behindness, left behind places, are first of all places, and I'll talk a bit more about what that means, so place, play, uh, focus on place I think is, ex is essential. But secondly, it is somehow, it is related to but different from deprivation. And I don't think we should conflate the two too closely. Um, the most obvious example of this is that on any <coughs> measure of deprivation, it is inner city places, particularly inner London, that are by far the most deprived. Okay? But I don't think anyone would suggest that inner city London is, is massively left behind in the sense of being ignored, um, left out of the narrative, not part of, uh, of a national conversation. So if left behind this means anything, it has to mean something that is not quite the same as deprivation, that is as much about a sense of being neglected and undervalued as it is about economic marginalization. Um, secondly, I was, uh, the, the question we were given was, uh, you know, should, should, should policy listen more to 
uh, people with lived experience in left behind places? And just the obvious answer is yes, of course. No, no one is going to stand up and say no, they shouldn't. The interesting question, therefore, is why we don't actually do so more often. Um, we have spent the last year uh, listening to people in left behind places. Sadly, given the year we've had, we weren't actually able to go and visit mm. any of them, so it was all done digitally, but there you go. Um, what came through very strongly was firstly that people wanted to be listened to and community activists around the country very much wanted to be listened to, but that was nowhere near enough. It's nowhere near enough just to listen to people. In fact, a lot of the community groups we spoke to were fed up with being listened to and then the same old policies being rolled out in exactly the same way. They don't just want to be listened to, they want to be actively empowered. They want to be given control over the resources and the decisions that directly affect their areas. And that's where I think uh, policy gets a little sticky. We're all, very, we're all happy to say, yes, of course we'll listen. We're much less happy to say, and here's a large check to do with whatever you think is right, yeah. Yeah? which is actually often what it takes. Um, what are in our recommendations? Is it's a fairly hefty report. I won't, I won't be reading all 55 policy recommendations for you, um, but just to focus very quickly on, on some of the, the top lines. Firstly, Investment in place really matters. The quality of neighbourhoods, the quality of the built environment is absolutely critical to left behind places and to people's sense of being left behind. Um, we sum that up really in, in three things. It's, um, trees, trams and tricycles. Uh, investing in street trees, small bits of urban greenery is the simplest, cheapest and most effective way to improve the quality of places quickly. It's remarkable. It really, really works. Um, I'll, le I'll just leave that there, but trust me, there's a huge amount of evidence on the efficacy of just inserting street trees into rundown places. Um, secondly, trams. The, we, are, we are ripe for an absolute revolution in uh, reconnecting local places with high quality, relatively low cost local transport. Okay? Um, there's, a huge, there's some very important regulatory changes and um, technology changes that mean that actually I think we're, we're on the verge of um, the potential, at least, for a massive new boom, boom in trams reconnecting our towns and suburbs. Um, and thirdly, tricycles. This is not really because I think tricycles are a massive transport solution. It's more a kind of conceptual idea. Uh, if you can imagine a place as being somewhere that uh, a small child could potter around on a, si on a tricycle, it's almost certainly a good place. Um, and, and conversely, if you can't imagine a child happily cycling around on a tricycle, it's probably not an extremely a very good place. It's probably not a successful place. It's probably not a prosperous place. All of these things really matter. We know for a fact that if you invest in the quality of, of local environments, you make a material difference to people's lived experience, their sense of pride, and the economic success of that place. So the simplest rule is just imag imagine the tricycle test. Um, that means particularly high streets, and high streets are the kind of lifeblood of, of community self-impressions as well as, uh, as kind of the practical day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, we urgently need to be reinvesting in the quality of the high street and making it fit for the 21st century. Um, the, the third thing that came through, much to my surprise actually, was, was homes. You know, people really do need in, um, investment in the quality of their housing stock, especially if we're ever going to meet the challenge of zero carbon. Um, that's going to require a huge amount of government investment to make that work, particularly in places where there isn't a lot of property value in them. And then finally, it really is back to where we started. It's about empowering local people with flexible funding. We need to get away from this ridiculous habit of, of only allowing funding to be allocated in competitive bidding pots that everyone has to bid 15 different <coughs> ways for that only last six months and that half the money doesn't get spent because there's too many treasury rules on it. You know, the, I, I pay tribute to a big local here where you know, the fantastic program where they've gone around giving checks for a million pounds to some of the most deprived communities in the country, so I, a country to do whatever they want with um, and it's worked extremely well. So I want to see uh, more long term, more flexible and more trusting funding. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Karina, would you be up for going next. Yep. So I'm Karina Reese Wood. I'm a community organiser for Thrive Teesside uh, from Stockton on Tees. I'm a member of Poverty to Solutions and I'm here today. We're a coalition of three community groups, ATD Fourth World, Dole Animators and Does That Thrive. We're all led by people with direct experience of poverty and a passion to make change. We're rooted in our communities in Leeds, Teesside and London and we come together with Dr Ruth Patrick and Dan Farley who's a graphic designer and after recognising that the problems within our communities were all the same, which were housing, communities and support, um, income and voice and voice being the most important because people feel silenced and not included in the debate in my community. We explored the issues and the barriers within our communities and worked together to create meaningful solutions and recognised our commitment to make change through our insight and experience and knowledge. We, this is how we've done this and we're proud to be recognised as one of the top 100 change makers for, uh, for 2020 by The Big Issue. 
we realised that addressing these issues would be a challenge and need input from lots of different areas of expertise to do this effectively. We believe that all experiences are equal and combining them can only lead to better outcomes. Ultimately, we want the government to commit to working with people with lived experience of socio-economic disadvantage in policy-making processes and decision-making. Communities don't want to feel left behind. They want to take some responsibility and be part of the debate and the decision-making, as it's in all our interest to have fairer policies. So I'm here to talk about opportunities on how we can work together in a genuine way and explore how this approach can achieve gov government objectives to ensure no one's left behind. This is a vital step in e efforts to level up and how we can do it together. I live and work in a deprived area, or what you might call a left behind community, but being left behind is nothing new to my community, it's only the label over the years that's changed. The government recognise this and they're trying to do something about it, which is a challenging task for any government. However, there's still urgent need to tackle poverty and the inequality head on, and this is an opportunity to do, th <coughs> excuse me, to do things differently, because if we continue to do the same things, we're only going to get the same results. So we welcome the government's commitment to levelling up, but it's not just about areas, it's about really listening to people and exploring what would this would look like and the benefits of doing so. <coughs> Some of the work we've done around tackling the digi digital divides made a real impact on people's lives. Being listened to can lead to positive change. My community recognised the problems with digital exclusion at the beginning of the pandemic and I had also seen it first and um, supporting people and with some of the difficulties they were facing. A lot of volunteers and communities were isolated and left vulnerable, not being able to access UC journals, problems with homeschooling, accessing services such as mental health, um, doctors forms, e-consult forms were difficult. I fed this back to our local VCS which then led them to employing a um, digital in inclusion officer engage with the community and get people connected by listening to the needs and including them in the decisions of how things can work better. This form of collaboration and partnership has transformi transformative potential if replicated in policy making processes at a national level. Just think what might have happened at the start of the pandemic if the government had reached out to communities like mine and asked about the challenges they would expected to face. Um, the issues with digital exclusion could have been immediately flagged <coughs> and preventive, pre preventative action taken. We might have seen some pupils able to engage with homeschooling much sooner and better and the government could have acted quicker and got better results. This is the potential of what merging expertise brings. As a coalition we've worked in partnership with lots of people and with other forms of expertise and it's only by merging insight and knowledge we can move forward together. Thank you. <laughs> Christian. Oh. Okay. Are you ready to speak now? <laughs> mm. um, well, uh, yeah, it's a, a very tough act to follow. Um, when we're talking about the people's voice in levelling up, um, great, but you know, we can't talk about people's voice until we know what levelling up actually means. And at the moment, it means you know, its biggest strength is its biggest weakness. It means nothing, and it means everything. Uh, for me, um, and arguably the, the most important you know, perspective of, of poverty is social mobility. So it's education, it's skills, it's training. Uh, you know, in, in four years' time, when we can point back and say, well, we've improved your life chances, we've improved your ability to get a meaningful job, that's levelling up. And if we can't do that in, in four years' time, or you know, by the next election, then actually we've failed as a party, we've failed as a government, and we've failed the country. Um, that's uh, the, the only real way of looking at it. Um, yeah, we, when we talk about li lived experience, for, for my background, yeah, I come from a, a working class family in, in Pendle, and you know, being there when I was elected to be able to stand in the House of Lords and you know, see the Queen's speech, I, I couldn't hear her, but I'm, I'm sure it was a very good speech. Uh, but to actually be there and think, uh, you know, I'm here. This is, you know, this this is me leveling myself up. You know, but what can we actually do for you know the kid who grew up on the council estate with me? What can we do for for anyone else in the country to make sure they have a real meaningful opportunity? And you know, it's not A levels. It's you know, T levels are great, 
but we need to be making sure that actually anything we're talking about is really, really accessible because if it's not or no one knows about it, then what's the point of it? Uh, I'll, I'll probably disagree with Toby slightly and I apologise uh, because there's a lot that you say that I completely agree with. Um, yes, we, we do need to talk to people, but we need to listen to people a lot more. Um, yeah, I, yeah, my constituency is what, four miles away from here. I represent one of the most deprived towns in the country, of Radcliffe. Um, it was a proud paper mill industry, you know, a proud industrial heritage. And you know, it's now a shell of its former self. So what are we doing for towns like Radcliffe? You know, we, we've been able to get a new school out, out of a free school program, but what are we actually doing when we're talking about leveling up and regenerating? And it can't just be a shiny new building. Uh, I mean, that, that's great, and I, I do actually hope to get one. Um, but what are we actually doing? And you know, this is a town that's it's got consultation fatigue. You know, every couple of years, we go back to them and say, well, what do you want to see? And you know, it's, it's almost like a consultation is the be-all and end-all. Mm -hmm. well, no, it's absolutely meaningless unless, unless we're actually doing something with those responses that we're getting back from people. And if we're not actually listening, if we're not actually doing anything about it, what's the point of doing it in the first place? Uh, so I, I generally think we're, we're now in a position where being able to look at Stockton and Teesside and Radcliffe or, you know, or, or Pendle, where I come from, I think we're finally starting to talk about these places. We're, we're starting to actually talk to the people. We just need to make sure we listen to them. Uh, because if, if we don't, then you know, from an electoral point of view, it's going to be you know, suicidal. Uh, from a sensible point of view, you know, we're failing a nation. Uh, and from a moral point of view, what the hell are we doing for these young people? What are we doing for the you know, 9 million people in this country who either can't read or struggle reading? You know, you know, if, if you can't help your own child in education, you know, that, that's kind of a... a you know, yeah, I, I, I've got what, two, two, two degrees and two A-levels of maths, and I, I think I'd probably struggle uh, doing G GCSE homework. Um, if you can't read, you're clearly not going to be able to help your own child. And from a, from, from a mental health aspect... You know, what, what does that actually make you feel like? Uh, we, we talk about you know, the, the economic side of things far, far, far too much, and you know, that's really important. But what about the health aspect? You know, we've had what, it, 10 years on from Marmot, and we've learnt nothing. You know, we're talking about addiction, we're talking about drugs and alcohol, and yes, we, we've finally overcome the stigma of mental health, but when we're talking about addiction, alcohol is well, it's, it's a personal choice. Wrong. It's a mental health issue. Drugs. Oh, it's a criminality aspect. No, it's a mental health issue. But why are we not talking about this in the, in the same aspect as we are for depression or anxiety? You know, because there's far, far too much that, that actually link, links a lot of these kind of conditions, if you will. But we're not talking about it properly. Um, language is very, very important. And I think, well, whilst we've got the um, uh, I'll probably, probably plug my own uh, comment in poll home, um, but you know, it's, it's almost like train spotting. You know, we've chosen a policy, we've chosen an idea, we've chosen a soundbite. We now, to, we now need to choose a meaning, uh, because uh, until it actually means something, it means nothing. It's such a vacuous phrase, but it's such an important one, and if we get it wrong, then uh, I'm, I'm sorry for everyone, uh, because we need to get it right, and we need to get it right quickly. So if there's one thing we can go away, hopefully from this conference, is, is with a meaning, um, because if we don't, why are we even here? Uh, so I, I think that's arguably the most thing, uh, but when we talk about education, far too much is focused on year 11, late, in, intensive, intrusive intervention to just about scrape a pass. What are we doing with our uh, early years? You know, our toddlers, and I, I declare an interest, I have a three year old daughter, so I want the best for her. But that means I want the best for every single child in this country because I have no idea what school she's going to going to go to. I, I hope I know, but I have no idea. So I, I want the best for her. So it means I want the best for your children, you know, your children, your children, um, because that's the only way we can make a meaningful improvement. But if you get a child's educational career right early on, then you don't need an intensive intervention in year eleven because they already know about learning. They know that their phonics. They can read. Get it right. Get it early. And, and just actually do something about it, that's levelling up. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. Um, Tracy. Was it me now? It's you, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting, I thought, right, never mind. 
Oh, you were just, dying to speak. <laughs> I was I am dying to speak. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed to be here today. Um, and I hope my contributions will enrich at what will be a lively debate following the introductions. Because I just had a little one line in there, although I'm at the tail end of the introductions, um, but never mind. I wanted to add a little bit of context. Um, that the voice that I'm bringing forward today is bigger than me, my own lived experience and my expertise. It's a wider reflection of the people that we work with, that we serve in our community and that I live alongside. Um, I'm trying to bring forward today their voice. And unfortunately, I couldn't bring 35,000 people or whatever into this room today to have their voice. Um, but we're a diverse community and that community is representative of the people who are on the zero hours contract. It's people who work agency work. It is people on a low pay. It is carers. It is volunteers. It is parents. But most of all, what we've got to remember today, it's people, people who feel that they don't have a voice and they want to be part of, part of the debate to affect change. Um, they don't always want things to have things done to them if they want to be part of a participatory proce process um, and, and, and want to take control of their lives and their livelihoods. We deliberated about attending a Conservative Party conference. This is a first for us. We've never, ever done it before. Um, but we did, we chose to come here, um, but before coming I was speaking to, to both people I work alongside and people who I live alongside and, and some of the comments that came back to me, some was um, doubtful, as in what do you hope to achieve by attending there, what's going to change, are people going to listen to you, but others were optimistic and that was good and they recognised that there's, there was something that needs to be done and the rich insight and knowledge and expertise that's held within communities needs to be harnessed. It needs to be harnessed that then can lead to a, a fuller debate that can lead to a fairer policy. So that everybody was in agreement with that. But what they were sick of is, is the repetition of telling their story. And I think as Toby yeah. mentioned earlier on, it isn't always about, yeah, you know, people listen, people listen, people listen, but then it's not actively acted upon. And that's the problem. And what happens is what people were getting a bit tired of was one of consultations, mm. of focus groups, of um, a survey, you know what I mean? And that continuous cycle of um, a tick box exercise, that's what it's felt like, and then a disengagement from the process. So what I'm bringing, I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> 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 I told them what I'm telling you today, right, that things can change that it will take some time. It is about developing relationships. It's about recognising that knowledge and insight is held within the communities of disadvantage. <coughs> it's about understanding that this is an ongoing process and it's not about a one-off consultation. And it's about accepting, like Karina said earlier on, that it's a merging of expertise. It's not to say lived experience is the only expertise that's needed around the table. It needs policy workers, it needs statisticians, statistici whatever it is, and it needs other people that can be in help inform the debate. This is radical and it can be transformative. But lived experience at the moment seems a bit of a buzzword. Mm -hmm. This unique insight and knowledge is derived from first-hand experience of an issue. But we're bigger than our lived experience. We have other skills. We've got a multitude of skills. We've got that reach into the community. We're problem solvers. We've got common sense. We've got an ability to research. We've got an ability to dig deep and fully understand what's happening. So to use a working example, I'm going to draw upon the issue of government debt deductions to illustrate some key points. There's a recognition that government debt deductions is a problem. The government recognises this. Other agencies evident this, evidence this, and our community is well attuned to the devastating impact that these deductions are having upon them. So this is an opportune time to align our knowledge, to demonstrate by doing, to evidence our participatory approach to policy making can have the desired intended outcomes. Mm. You may all be well aware, I don't know if you are, that in April 2020, Figures showed or indicated that 41% of uni universal credit claimers had some kind of government debt deduction. So I'll talk about Teesside, Middlesbrough's an area of Teesside, and of the 10,500 claimants, 60% had an average of £61 being deducted each month. These are harsh figures. These figures were replicated in other areas throughout Teesside and throughout the UK. Already struggling to, be, to get by, People are having to make tough choices. Do I put food on the table? 
Do I limit my energy use? Do I top up my phone so I can access my universal credit account or to get onto the school portal so I can check my child's homework? All are of equal importance, but something will have to give. Research into the issue concludes that government debt repayment practices are outmoded, and we have welcomed an acknowledgement and a response by the government, reducing levels of repayments, the introduction of the breathing <coughs> space, but these responses have not gone far enough. We have neglected to consider the full complexity of the issues at hand, and they've not reflected the wealth of insight held in within our communities. I can, I can name but a few examples here. It's vitally important, oh no, the data in communities sheds light on a number of the issues. Being aware that claimants don't often know when the end date of their debt deductions is, is key. Being aware that the first thing that they actually know about a debt deduction is when they go to get their uh, benefit at the end of one week. Navigating an online journal is difficult and then when you're trying to seek the help or the support or to understand what's coming out, it's very difficult to find. So it is of value to have this insight and I know I've just said that, I'm saying it again. It can inform a more appropriate policy response and it can mitigate any unintended consequences. We're not a campaigning group anymore. We're advocating for a particular approach to policy making. We accept that we can't do this alone, hence we're here today. We've reached out to others. We've reached out to the Centre for Social Justice. We spoke to the Resolution Foundation. We've got into contact with Step Change, another big massive debt advisors. And I'm nearly done, so don't worry. <laughs> the expertise we offer is greater than our lived experience, but it's through our experiences that we're able to offer insight and expertise. We appreciate that designing and implementing a fair and robust policy agenda is difficult. It will be difficult for any government, and we know it's a challenge in tax. I hope my contributions will help inform the debate later and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Right. So, last but not least, uh, Ryan, would you like to make some remarks? Yes, great. <coughs> um, and it was, it's fantastic, particularly to hear from uh, Karina and Tracy, and thank you for partnering with us on the event. Um, I mean, my background is research, and I'm always thinking, where's the best evidence? Uh, and, you know, I, I think Tracy is right, which is there's a wealth of knowledge and depth of experience uh, in public voices and expertise by experience, and that has to be a valued part of the evidence base. Um, uh, and so uh, that was fantastic to hear. When we do do reports, we try uh, and consult with the public, often through... Um, what sounds like quite kind of wonkish research techniques like polling and depth interviews. But of course it is rooted in uh, public views and we try and do that in a way which is quite representative. So you get a good range of people within the samples that you do. And we did one on UC quite recently um, and a couple of policies actually came from pe uh, people who were, we were being interviewed. So one was around, you know, there's a claimant commitment. So if I... Uh, as somebody who's claiming universal credit, don't uh, comply with the rules around it, there's a threat of being sanctioned. Well, what happens if DWP doesn't pay me on time, you know, through no fault of my own? Where's the consequence for DWP? So the policy was, well, maybe there should be some kind of, you know, commitment on the DWP. If they don't deliver on time, maybe there should be compensation or something for me. That came from a claimant, and it's something that we put in our report uh, as a policy idea, uh, and it's something I know that Amber Rod, when she was Welfare Secretary, was very interested in uh, and, uh, and seriously considering looking at. And the second was just, uh, you know, having a, an app for people with mobile phones to access their online journals, particularly younger U UC claimants as well. Uh, and we talked to the DWP about this. Uh, they said, well, there's lots of issues going on with the IT around universal credit, so we're not quite in a place uh, to do that. But if we are, that is something that we'll seriously look at. Both of those policies came from the consultation that we had uh, with UC claimants. And that just shows you really the kind of wealth of great ideas that come from uh, the community. Just two issues that I want to pick up on. First, which I think Christian mentioned, was what is levelling up? It's such a kind of, um, you know, vague idea at the moment. Uh, and the second is how the public feed into uh, helping with levelling up. 
The speech that the Prime Minister did in the summer around levelling up, I think, provided no clarity. Um, uh, and there's a danger here that if there's no parameters about what levelling up means, there's a danger that ministers, campaigners say, you know, here's my idea for levelling up, and then you're kind of levelling up towns, levelling up schools, levelling up theatres, levelling up party conferences. You kind of level up everything possible, uh, and it becomes a bit farcical, and there is a danger uh, with uh, the government's agenda that there's a kind of meaningless to it, uh, and it becomes a bit of a kind of laughing stock. Um, but more seriously, I think there's a kind of uh, general view uh, and consensus that it's about helping so-called left-behind places and people, especially in coastal and former industrial areas, areas that voted decisively for Brexit and have begun to, or indeed have done for the first time in a generation, swing to the Tories. And what's interesting is that the modernisation process that David Cameron pursued, if you remember, back in the early part of the last decade, to detoxify the brand, make it much more uh, warm and fuzzy, um, uh, particularly in areas of northern England and Wales, who were scarred by the pit closures, particularly uh, under the Thatcher period. Actually, it wasn't Cameron's modernisation agenda. It was Brexit, really, which detoxified the Tory brand. Um, and gave them, gave those voters and their families the chance for the first time in decades to have a reason to vote Tory. And get Brexit done, it was a kind of, you know, plain but simple message, which was kind of no more silly buggers around Brexit, basically, um, which had wide appeal. But as the PM has admitted, you know, those votes from those people in red wall seats have been lent to the Tories. The focus now is upon delivery. Uh, and really improving life chances. The majorities in those areas are slim, uh, so the Tories uh, really do have to focus on delivery. So thinking about improving those areas, to be honest, there's been countless initiatives, regeneration initiatives, since the 1960s. Um, the levelling up fund and the stronger towns <coughs> fund that governments introduced are really just simply repeats of what has come before, albeit with smaller pots of money. So there was the Single Regeneration Fund, uh, which the Conservative government in the 90s introduced, and then there was the New Deal for Communities in the noughties. These initiatives encourage local partners to come together to bid for central government funding to help with regeneration. And that's the basis of the idea for the Leveling Up Fund. Um, and indeed, I think, you know, why it's not necessarily anything new in terms of intervening, the, in, intervening in these areas. A lot of people say the very purpose, the very essence of government is to help these sorts of areas where the market is unable to help those people in places. That's the job of government, any government. Um, and in terms of the evidence from these local regeneration initiatives in the past, the evidence is that it can make a marginal difference. Um, but it has to be long-term patient funding and the outcomes in terms of improved outcomes for people's employment prospects, their well-being, their sense of pride uh, and esteem in their place, um, you know, it, can, it, it requires a long time, but it's quite marginal. And in fact, what makes the most difference to those areas tends to be the level of public and private investment in those areas and the employment opportunities that falls from it. And that's going to be hard for the government because obviously the pandemic has had quite a substantial and significant impact on particularly employment prospects. We've done work which shows that the jump in UC claimants during the pandemic, so people who come on to UC, and that could be people who have lost their jobs, but also people who are facing reduced hours or pay cuts. The biggest jump is in London. Um, in one area, and that makes sense because a lot of the uh, jobs in London are around hospitality and retail, which have obviously been badly hit by the pandemic. But also, the other areas that have been really hit, where they've seen the biggest jump in UC claimants, are the so-called left-behind areas, coastal areas, former industrial uh, heart, uh, heartlands. Um, so, uh, and this has happened before in previous rece recessions where London is hit particularly badly, but the thing about London is it bounces back quite quickly because the level of education and skills in those areas tends to be quite high and there is obviously a strong correlation between skill levels and employment prospects, particularly 
in this country. So, really the analysis, this is hard um, and it's not necessarily unique. But I think, in fairness to the government, there are kind of seeds of uniqueness in their agenda. And Michael Gove, who's now in charge of the Department for Leveling Up, has articulated this. The first is, it's not just about investing economically in an area, it's also about the social infrastructure of an area. How do we kind of catalyse civic activity and pride in those areas? And the second, I suppose, it is captured in the phrase that Michael talked about, which is, stay local but go far. And it's the sense of, you know, I think for a long time the Tories, it's, it's the kind of Billy Elliot story, which is how do we get a bright, talented person from a so-called left-behind area, send them to grammar school, send them to good university, and then eventually they go to London and, you know, do well uh, in life. Actually, I think what the Tories are thinking about now is, actually, how do we make those, how do we raise up those whole places? How do we make them attractive places that mm. talented people want to stay in, start a business uh, and work in? Although what I would say is the really interesting evidence I've seen um, from the Sutton Trust, which is a lot of people who experience very long haul social mobility, i.e. the kind of rags to riches story. Uh, recent evidence I've seen on that was that a majority of those people actually haven't moved very far geographically uh, in their lives, which completely goes against the narrative, which is if you, you, know, if you do the rags to riches, you have to kind of move to London and do really well. But about 70% of people who go on that social mobility journey actually don't do a long haul geographic move, which I find really interesting and kind of slightly challenging to, to what the government's saying. Um, and then I think on social infrastructure, um, I think the real focus and the opportunity for the Tories is institution building in those areas. How can we create uh, institutions, platforms for people from different backgrounds to come together? And I think children are often the social glue. They're the kind of uh, trigger point for people to say, well, I need to engage in services and facilities and meet new people because I want to provide opportunities for my kids. So I think we need to think very hard about institutions centred around children. For example, children's centres, which the government's now calling family hubs. I think it's completely wrong that government cut funding for those centres, um, particularly as they were so good, not only for, uh, for children, but also for parents to come t t together. So really focusing on those as areas where new relationships uh, can, be, can be formed. Uh, and also, you know, how can we get, in, how can we get parents, particularly from uh, more disadvantaged backgrounds, engaged uh, in their school, not just turning up at the school gate, but being part of the governing body, the parent-teacher association, to really strengthen their networks. Um, and I think there needs to be a real focus on that, because lots of evidence on um, people who have stronger and more diverse social networks, not just about money, money of course is totally important, but those people who have stronger relationships, less likely to live in material poverty, more likely to experience social mobility. Lots more evidence on that. So not just about money, also about stronger relationships. And then finally, um, I'll just talk about engaging the public. And I think it's totally right about lived experience. What I would say is, of course, Though it's also important that we, when we do capture public views, we do so in a way which gets a representative sample uh, and makes sure that we get a range of views uh, in that. And that's sometimes, you know, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but sometimes why, if you do polling, focus groups, depth interviews, things like that, you can do that. I'm not saying it's the best and only way, but sometimes it makes sure that you, you, you get a kind of range of voices when you are uh, engaging with people. And then finally, just on, um, uh, on uh, money matters, which Tracy talked about, I think you know, the government is totally wrong to cut the uplift in the universal credit and really will have profound impacts on the idea of levelling up. You know, I noticed in Rishi's speech today, he talked about the focus for helping left behind areas is about employment. Um, and what he wants to do is create this dividing line between the Tories standing for employment and jobs and Labour and the left standing for welfare. You know, almost half of people on universal credit now are in work. Um, you know, there's a lot of in-work poverty, so it's not true that work is necessarily the only route out of poverty. And the other thing I would say is, you know, 
now we're coming out of the pandemic, employment is rising again, lots of vacancies in key sectors. I don't think it's true. There isn't the evidence to suggest that universal credit uplift, the higher level of benefits people have been receiving, has undermined work, incent work incentives. It's not led to loads of people saying, well, I'm not going to engage in the jobs market, because obviously what's happening is employment is rising again. So there just isn't the evidence to back up what the Chancellor is saying. So we have joined a whole range of organisations to say, look, uh, let's keep that uh, uplift, because, you know, money matters. Yes, there's lots of other factors which influence um, poverty uh, and make people more likely to live in poverty. But, you know, at the end of the day, not having enough money is really major part of it. Um, uh, and I think the government is, is wrong to cut it. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I wondered if I could just ask some, a question myself before we go and throw it open to questions out there. Um, for Tracy and um, Karina, I wondered um, two things really. I think the use of language is really important and when we're talking about um, left behind communities, I wanted to ask whether you find that an offensive phrase or whether you think it's useful in trying to communicate messages um, that you think are important. Um, and then I wondered actually if I could ask as well, um, when you felt the last time was you'd had a really um, fruitful consultation um, experience, maybe with the government or maybe with lo the local, local government, just to ask when you felt you'd had a genuinely meaningful sort of dialogue that had led to some sort of positive change. Do you want me to start? Yeah. As, as for the use of language, I think that always depends on the context of the language, doesn't it? Um, and, and left behind, so, we, so before coming here today, we went out and we said, well, what does left behind actually mean to you? Um, and, and some people would respond, it mean, and they would respond in a way that would say um, it means that we've been underfunded, under-resourced, not listened to. So in that context, it depends how you put it like that, it wasn't seen in a negative way or a derogatory way, it was seen as an opportunity to create a conversation. Okay. So, so in that respect, that was positive. In other respects, you could talk to people and left behind said, well, we're always left behind. We're always ignored, and that's quite a mm. negative connotation then, in that respect. Um, and the last time I had any fruitful um, consultation was probably in the world of academia, because I think the world of academia has moved a lot further forward and, and, and they'll do participatory research and they will involve you from the onset and they will involve you in, in, in what's the issue that we need to research. So in that respect, that's been generally quite positive over the last few years. Uh, with re regards to government, the things that we've been involved with have been more primarily, you know, like a call for evidence mm -hmm. um, and something like that. So we'll put the call for evidence in and, and, and it'll be out there in the ether, but then we don't really get the feedback, whether we should or we shouldn't, I'm not, say, I'm not saying that, but then it's, sort of, it's gone, but then what's happened with it? What's, you know, what's been the impact of our in input there? So there would be some of the comments I would give back on that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, I don't know if any of the panel wanted to make a comment on that, but um, Christian, you were, um, especially when we talk about universal credit, you were, I, I got the impression that you think the um, ending the uplift is a bad move. Is, is that right? Um, it, it is absolutely the wrong time to even be thinking about it. Um, yeah, when we... When we're talking about coming out of the, uh, the pandemic, when we're talking about people trying to get back into work, when we're talking about furlough ending, when we're talking about the increase in access to fuel, you know, price of fuel, price of food, Christmas, um, no, just why, why are we, you know, if, if you're, if there's the fiscal argument, I, and I, I get it's six billion pounds a year, but if we're talking about, you know, our left behind communities, our forgotten communities, you know, the, the, the one sure way of saying, well, two fingers to you, we don't really care, is by removing that support network. And I, I feel we're doing it. Um, that there's an argument for doing it. It's just clearly the wrong time. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with taking it away in its entirety anyway, but yeah, it's, yeah, so wrong. It's wrong, okay. <laughs> Is there anything that, um, Ryan, you wanted to come in on any points we've just been discussed? Sorry, it's quite hard to see. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm all right, actually. I'm happy to take um, audience Good questions. questions. Okay, so we've got a, a roving mic that's going to come around. And when you ask your question, are you able to introduce yourself and say um, where you're from? If that's okay. Um, there's a lady here. <coughs> 
So, um, obviously, when the, the pandemic hit... Um, sorry, would you mind um, just saying your name? Oh, yeah, sorry. My name is um, well. Nadine Bachelor and um, Yahoo News. Um, so, obviously, when the pandemic hit, and Andy Burnham was quite outspoken about this, particularly areas like the North West and the Midlands were hit hardest. Um, Manchester was in lockdown um, longer than, say, places in the South. Birmingham was in lockdown slightly more. Do you, um, this kind of directed, not sorry, not in the Northwest, I mean in the South. Um, do you think the government have taken that seriously enough? And do you think the government are appreciating the kind of long term effects that could have? Um, and if not, what do you think needs to be done? Is that the. Uh, you all of you, but <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, no and no. Uh, is the, the very short response. Um, we looked at the, uh, from a, from a, a ch child's point, point of view with the, the educational re recovery, um, yeah, it's fantastic we're, we're actually talking about that. Um, and the Sir Kevin Collins report, uh, 15 billion uh, to decide, well, yeah, we're so passionate about our children, we're so passionate about leveling up uh, that we're giving you 10%. Fantastic. Um, there's a lot more we need to be doing. Um, there's a lot of a, a wider conversation we need to be having of do we change the school day, do we make it longer, what can we actually do uh, moving forward to actually, uh, and again, language is important. You know, when, we, when we're saying you know, you've missed out, you've lost education, you're failing, then you know, I'm sorry, but the impact this is actually having on our young people just for, through the language we're using, not helpful. Um, but what I, what I want to see, and I've had a couple of conversations, uh, not this week, uh, but uh, four days ago, what are we doing about the mental health impacts on our children? Because if you're, if you're not in the right state of mind to actually be learning, then you know, the catch-up is pointless. Um, so we, we, we need to be having a much more, uh, and I say this as, as a chemist, uh, we need to have a much more holistic view as to what we're doing for our young people. And I don't think we've got that right. I don't think we're having the right conversations. And you know, unfortunately, Gavin was not the right person to be, be chairing that. That, that discussion. Um, so I, I, I like to think we're in a in a stronger position now, but I, I think we need to speak very quickly, find out what, what we can do for, for our young people in a meaningful long-term plan, um, because otherwise you know, that's leveling up. And if, you know, if we're failing our young people, you know, you know, we're, we're failing the future. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, quite a lot of people. Where's the microphone gone? Hi there, Daisy from the Joseph Browntree Foundation, um, and thank you for the event today. It's been fascinating to hear from you all. Um, just really interested in particularly the view from Christian, but also Ryan and Toby in terms of your closeness to government, um, about how we can start to shift some of the cultural barriers to government working in a more participatory way. I was just at a really interesting fringe event um, in the Central Convention Centre on kind of groupthink um, and how we can challenge that. And lots of consensus from the panel, um, including Laura Trott, um, Steve Baker, Greg Clark, all the sort of great and the good that um, bringing our diversity of perspectives into policy making um, really strengthens the outcome. Um, but not as much discussion on the kind of cultural barriers um, that we need to overcome to do that, where I think it's very easy to sort of nod along, but actually shifting particularly in the heart of government in number 10, in, num in, in Treasury, um, shifting how they do things um, to actually bring in a more participatory approach is, is, is a big challenge. So just any kind of thoughts on how we can start to overcome what is often a very centuries-old way of doing things. Do you mind if we go to Toby on that Thank one? Is you. that okay? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive challenge. And I, 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 personal experience of this was, was quite extreme. I, I went straight from shelter to working inside number 10 and it is it's completely bonkers bluntly um you know it's, a, it's people talk about the westminster bubble it's, it's worse than that number 10 is like a bubble inside a bubble inside a bubble there are about 15 layers before you'd even begin you'd have to penetrate before you'd be, even begin to get to anything yeah. kind of resembling the front line the real world um and that's just within london let alone like the left behind places of the northwest, for example. So, yeah, and it's, it's a huge problem. And in all honesty, I, it's, it's very, very hard to see how you would start to change that because it's so deeply entrenched. And yeah, it's, it's not through anyone's kind of malevolence. It just, it's just baked into the, the structure of the system. Um, the one thing I would say therefore is, is that I think the, the, the methodology that I think would start to address that is to, be, is, is to think more holistically and to start getting away from kind of these siloed um, 
departmental budgets where everything is a budget for a specific thing fought for viciously with the treasury between mm -hmm. you know within, within your bubble between my department and treasury and then you get to spend it on your thing so you know transport will jealously guard their transport budget and um, they don't want, don't want anyone else coming anywhere near it you know whereas something like an interest in leveling up um will not work on that basis you have to be comprehensive you have to look at the place as a whole you have to think about the educational impacts the the the, the health impacts the you know all of these different budget lines as actually start to build it up from the place upwards so i think actually this renewed focus on place is the best hope we have for beginning to break that kind of bubble mentality because it just forces you to think about locality and all of the different issues that affect it but our acceptance of it is a really it's a long going to be a long haul to get there Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we have a parliamentary system which is steeped in decades, centuries of tradition. And some of it is incredibly helpful when you're in government. And you know, I think of the voting lobby being a prime example of actually being able to meet a minister because you literally grab them and talk at them on, until they, they hear you. Um, but trying to get a meaningful conversation is challenging. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm probably in a fortunate position, you know, Dan Rosenfield, you know, Chief of Staff is, uh, is from my constituency. He knows Whitefield, he, he knows Berry South. Um, but trying to get through all, all, all the gatekeepers and everything else is, is a big challenge. Uh, and that's through you know, a, a backbench MP, one of the most marginal seats in the country. You, you would hope that I, I would be able to say, well, you know, this is what we're, we're talking about and th this is what it means and, and what we need to do. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what Toby said. I, I, I think whether, whether it's leveling up or net zero, uh, you know, local government, central government, uh, excuse my French, mail, crap, are talking across department. You know, wh why can we not have a housing policy that actually speaks about education and health and everything all in, all in one conversation? You know, talking about the environment, what we're doing in terms of you know, you know, teaching it properly. Um, we, we, are, we are poor, very, very poor. Uh, having those conversations because it's you know like toby said you, you have dwp saying this is our budget we, we must you know look after it and you've got education this is our budget we must look we can't have any good and you know it's almost like a competition as to who, who can you know hold on to the most without thinking well how can we work better together how, how can we work better um, across the department and, and again com you know compromise is not a dirty word but it feels like it is or, or if you make the wrong compromise um, then, then you, you get you know, pilloried about it. You know, we, we need to be having these conversations, and you know, I don't think we are. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was speaking at a uh, fringe event earlier with me, Barry Gardner, and, and two trade unionists. Um, and that, yeah, it was, uh, it was weird, you know, from the outside thinking that there's a Tory MP with a Labour MP and, and trade unions. But that is what compromise looks like. That's what a meaningful adult conversation looks like. You know, we, you know, we, you know tribal politics has got so toxic in, in the last well, six years uh, from pre-Brexit. Pre and you know, we need to find a way to overcome that because otherwise we're not going to achieve anything. Um, I, I like to think I'm in a very strong position where I, I have a very good working relationship with, with my Labour Council. But I know many MPs who, you know, it's, it's a Labour Council, I won't work with them because they'll claim credit for what I'm doing. I don't care who I've got to work with, providing I achieve what I want to. And if that means w working with Andy Burnham to get apprenticeships working in, in Greater Manchester, fine. If it means working with Andy Burnham to reduce rough sleeping and homelessness, fine. If it means working with Marcus Rashford about ho holiday hunger, I'm more than happy to. I mean, I, I'm a, a Manchester United fan anyway, so very easy there. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't care who I've got to work with because you know, we, you know, we have to have these conversations, otherwise, we, we are failing people. Can I just add into that then? So, going back to the question about, you know, obviously the cultural shift, and mm. today we've brought like a lived experience perspective and we've brought a Westminster perspective together and, and, and we've talked about the challenges and that. So, just from a selfish point of view from our community now is it like what would you suggest would be the first steps then you know to, to try to open them doors to have them conversations because this is it's quite difficult for our communities to, to bring their voice and, and and their expertise to, to the debate to affect change um so i was hoping today as well that part of this panel or, or the mm. audience they can say well i'm not saying it's a linear process you do this then you do that then no. you do the other but 
you know, if, if you were to give us some advice or some of your wisdom and, and your expertise today, what would it be? I, I, I think, to be fair, a, a, a lot of that comes back to people like me to make sure that we're engaging with you rather than you having to you know, go out of your way to engage with us. Mm. Um, I mean, w when we talk about li lived experience, yeah, I, I, I grew up on a council estate. Uh, I, I lost my dad at the age of 11. I've mm. you know, lost my brother to alcohol addiction. You know, there's a lot of lived experience, and from the 29 intake, we we are arguably a lot more representative than we have been before, um, but we need to find a way to actually get normal people involved in politics, uh, and that's that's not necessarily a job for you. It's a job for us to make sure that we're available, we're accessible, and that we're engaging. Um, I mean, you carry on the, the great work that you're doing, <coughs> and, and actually, we want to talk to you. Uh, we will. Well, I want to talk to you. Uh, I, I, you know, for for me, I, I want to go out and speak to every school, every charity, every business to hear what their concerns are, because it, it's fine me walking in and going, well, I think you need this, but actually that's wrong. Mm -hmm, it's, that's what do you wrong. need and how can I help you? Um, the only way to do that is having a, a, an adult conversation, and if I'm wrong, I'll stand up and say, well, I'm occasionally incorrect, but never wrong. <laughs> um, oh. But it's, it's having a, a, a very serious conversation, and you know, you know, whether it's Chapman House Rules or, or Blunt, and you know, yeah. if, you, if you say you're getting it wrong, and you need to change this, yeah. have it, we're, 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 in, we're, we're adults. Oh, I could go further on this debate, but oh, I guess okay. the 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 question. Let's bring more audience, more audience question. Okay, yes. Um, so the gentleman on the front, uh, on the left. Firstly, just thanks to Karina and Tracy for taking a risk and coming to conference. <laughs> uh, I'd sort of echo what Christian said. It's the Conservative Party is the most diverse and representative it's ever been. So keep showing up because your time to influence is now. So come again and come again. And this will be on centre stage one day. Um, so reading between the lines, is there a stronger argument for devolution here? Would be, would be a question, because there's a lot of frustration in the room about bubbles and uh, cross-department working. So is, actually, is this underpinning a stronger argument for devolution? And um, just coming back to the family hubs, obviously we had Shorestar and the, the stats tragically came out long after the funding had been pulled that they're really effective. So I'd just be really interested to hear from uh, Ryan and Toby just on any sort of specific things that really work in terms of social mobility in local areas. Thanks. Um, I suppose, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it does mean devolution. Uh, we, did, I mean, we chose actually not to get too heavily into the devolution debate because it has a habit of completely hijacking and derailing whatever kind of policy debate you're trying to have in this country. But the fact remains that we have the most, you know, famously the most centralised state system in, in the OECD, and that is a massive part of the problem. We ha urgently need to refloat local government. You know, it's, it's just, you just cannot deliver any of these services without a functioning local state. Mm -hmm. And that does mean, and I really welcome Christian's recognition here, that um, that means you have to support and work with local government, even if they're from the other party. Imagine that. I mean, it's called democracy, right? Um, you can't, you can't draw, draw, can draw those sort of battle lines and refuse to work up a kind of vertically as, as, as well as across the country. Um, but it also means going further. I think it, we, need, we need devolution that isn't just replicating kind of 300 odd mini Westminsters at the local level, right? um, but it actually means empowering communities directly themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you know, the call for a, a community wealth fund that will actually enable, you know, build on the example of, of, the, of the big local fund to actually demonstrate how, which has demonstrated so well how local communities can really make a difference once they're entrusted with their own resources and power yeah. to do things. Um, but ultimately, it does mean that we have to actually you know, fund local government communities, not just for a year, not just for six months for this particular project, but just by right. You know, um, We have an incredibly centralised, vertically integrated uh, fiscal settlement in this country. And, that, and it really marks it out from compared to pretty much any other comparative country you choose, choose to find. And that, if we're wondering why this country is so geographically, economically unbalanced, that has to be a very large part of it. And unfortunately, that means central government just recognising that it's going to have to let a lot of the fiscal kind of control go to, to places and people that they don't necessarily like. On, on the second uh, question that you asked on um, social mobility in local areas, I mean, there isn't a kind of single magic bullet which will change things. It's obviously um, a, a kind of uh, a variety of interventions 
And of course, the other thing that policymakers can fall into is the sort of very mechanical view of the world, which is if I put input A into a local area, I'm going to get output B. There's all sorts of um, you know, things that might influence it, the, the way that people respond to um, that particular policy, uh, the sort of relationships and networks that already exist in the community. So, you know, the idea that Westminster can come in and say, here's policy, policy X and I'm going to get outcome Y um, is for the birds often. Um, but there are some interventions we know do work, so there's no need to be kind of fatalistic about it. Um, and my view on social mobility is the earlier you start, the better. Um, and Leon Feinstein, uh, who used to be at the Children's Commissioner, did, uh, used to be part of the Office of the Children's Commissioner, basically showed that you know, the level of cognitive ability for children age five is very strongly related to their educational outcomes at 26. So it's not being deterministic about it, which is, you know, if your child doesn't do this at the age of five, then they won't be anywhere at the age of 28. But it's obviously saying the most critical window is the early years. And to be honest, I think a lot of the debate on education policy is often around later on in the education process. Uh, you know, too many people go to university, let's widen routes to apprenticeships and, and FE. And those things are good and do make a difference. But I think if you're really going to make a difference, it has to be in the early years. Um, I think the most important part of the education system is the preschool uh, bit. Um, so under fives, um, a lot, you know, because they're in nursery doesn't mean they're sort of they're sat at desks, rote learning, learning Latin. You know, they're learning through play. Uh, but it is really critical for their cognitive, social, and emotional development. And that is a very low-paid, low-status profession. Um, and really, we need to think about how do we get the best people into early years uh, as early years teachers. Um, and I want the government to focus much more. You know, a lot of the time, the policy is focused on... Um, how can we make this more affordable for parents mm. as a service for working parents? And of course, childcare is that, and that is important. But it's also, you know, the most important part of the education system. So I think we need to make sure that government focuses a lot more energy and resource and funding on improving the quality of early years education. That means getting really good people uh, into it. Uh, and my view, actually, more radically, is that, you know, over time, um, that should be compulsory for people to do early years education. It doesn't matter whether somebody is staying at home or are working parents for a particular period of time. If it's affordable, universal, high quality for everybody, I think it should be compulsory, which is a more radical uh, thing. But uh, that's my view, and I think that's what will really make a difference to social mobility in the long term. Second point, which I just want to make, which Christian touched upon, which is I think the impact of... Uh, children, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, not being in school during the lockdown is really serious and really profound, and the government is being desperately complacent about it. Um, I am really concerned about the long-term impacts because it's not just projected now, it's actual evidence which shows that children who should be at a certain level are not at that level in certain skills, and it's particularly um, earlier on and particularly in more disadvantaged communities. Um, you know, my own view is that because, you know, the best time to act would have probably been, you know, having a shorter summer holiday, for example, um, and, you know, extending time in the classroom during those uh, holidays. And the reason I say that is because Kevin Collins was talking about extending the school day in future years, which I see merit in, but obviously, you know, children go up to the next school year. They're learning new skills and parts of the mm. curriculum. Uh, and if they haven't got last year's stuff to build upon the foundations, then it's going to be a struggle for them. So, you know, we've obviously now passed that year. We're in a new school year now, but it would have been better to act uh, earlier. Um, and I actually think in the future, to be honest, we should be looking at you know, shortening summer school holidays. It, and, you know, lots of middle class people like those long summer holidays. It's great. Lots of opportunities, extracurricular stuff, loads of friendships. For a lot of people without much money, it's a terrible time. It's boring. And about, you know, two thirds, uh, uh, the evidence is about the, the, around the attainment gap between poor and rich kids. A lot of it is explained by those long summer holidays. That's when the gap really 
widens. So uh, I think we need to be thinking much more radically about the catch-up, um, and I'm, I'm really, really concerned about it. I think it's going to be one of the most lasting impacts uh, of COVID, and we need to do something really radically now about it. Thank yes, you. yes, a million times, <laughs> yes. Um, woman in the front, can we just take a question? Thanks. Hi, I'm Ruth and I'm from the University of York. I just wanted to kind of encourage the panel to go back to process rather than policies. So just there we were talking about um, kind of catch up in education and earlier we heard from Koi about how actually if at the start of the pandemic the government had actually said what do you need, what do you need in these left behind communities? The answer would have been we need access to Wi-Fi so we can engage in home, home learning. So if we'd started from that pro process and worked better we might not be in this position now in terms of these concerns about children and catch up. So really thinking about that process, so there's kind of an invitation from I guess from Poverty Solutions to say we really want to work with different forms of expertise, we want to merge expertise and I guess we've heard you know, from other members of the panel the importance of lived experience, the challenge of the kind of number 10 bubble, but then how, how can we form new collaborations, new connections, how can maybe some of the other panel members maybe show by trialling this merging of expertise that we can get better solutions if we work in that way. So I think it's just to go back to process rather than specific policies. Tracy or Kunev has a, a view on that and what you want. <laughs> I, I think that that's what I was doing. I, I, I was urging there, obviously, for that, that point to be raised there. Um, and and it was a, there's been a couple of points made throughout the panel today, you know, regarding um, what do we do, how can we do it, this needs to happen, blah, blah, blah. But it is about the process. The community themselves will illuminate <coughs> and will add richness and depth to a debate that can lead to a, um, you know, a course of action that will create more positive outcomes, uh, whether it be around um, you know, young children and um, their school age. I mean, just as a side issue, I was thinking, I was thinking about my community there, and I was thinking, you know, they're, you know, when you talk to them about education and young children at school, I mean, th they don't want their knowledge tested by a standardised test to say this is knowledge and this is experience and this is expertise and this will lead on to whatever. Um, it, it's about addressing some of the barriers that in, uh, prevent them from participating in a, a, mm. in, you know, a more productive way or a, a, a way that works for them. And, and so the points I'll make will just concur with Ruth said it's about let's think about the process and how we can you know, use this information in order to do things in, you know, to create a fair or better world. I know that was a bit woolly, but it isn't. It, <laughs> it, it's about going back to the process. I think you said earlier that you felt like as though there'd been consultation fatigue. I'm not sure if it was you that said it or Karina yeah. who said it. Um, I mean, how do you get around that? Because you want to be involved. But is it is it just that there has to be a, a feeling that it's genuine? It has to be genuine, mm. and it's not like I say, just uh, let's go in. Uh, and I'm doing this in a very simplistic way. Um, particularly, you could talk about a regeneration project, um, new deals for communities or whatever. Anything. Uh, come in. Um, I do a better one. Towns fund comes out now, so you get something online, and the, the you know the borough council, whatever borough council it is, I'll say, you know, input your thoughts, da da da, whatever and then it'll go away, the plan will be drawn up and then something will happen. And that's what happens in a general way. I'm generalising that, but that's what tends to happen. But the rich discussions to say this and that and think things through, that doesn't happen. So the input is there, but then you don't have the next level of no. engagement after that. No. When people, right, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think the, when we talk about pro processes, you know, it sounds as boring <laughs> as possible, doesn't it? What we're talking here about is institutions, right? Yeah. It's, it's, there's a reason why, you know, the NHS is always top of the, of the list for funding, but um, social care isn't. It's not because people don't care about it. It's because the NHS is this iconic institution that, we have, that, that has an absolute kind of lock on our psyche, and therefore people will vote for it and politicians will respond. <clears throat> um, if you look at education policy now uh, new governments come in and they and it's a real political football a yeah. direct political football they should get but no one suggests we should abolish schools right no one suggests this, oh we should, shouldn't have education policy that is exactly what happens to regeneration policy it gets completely abolished every 10 20 years and then and then and then rediscovered and rebuilt it's because there are no kind of lasting institutions that we can kind of that, that no one could touch in this space um, and then and instead we end up with Bluntly, kind of uh, like under the new Labour year, um, era, a whole series of different programmes, some of which work better than others, and they were just beginning to work out what might work, and then those were all abolished, and we got, you know, 
the big society, and then that gets dropped. You know, we're, we're constantly throwing out um, concepts and programs rather than actually building lasting institutions that can really deliver um, perennial change. And this is why I think actually devolution is part of it, because we need to be building not just kind of short-term ideas, but actual you know, last, lasting bodies that have that democratic accountability and legitimacy that we can support for the, and, and recognise we'll be here in 30 years' time, because this is long-term stuff. Are you suggesting Metro Mayors could perhaps be an umbrella moment? Um, I, 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 I mean, again, I, I've carefully avoided saying exactly what the correct devolution <laughs> suggestion is, uh, solution is, because it's such a mess in this country. It's, I mean, it's just such a mess that it's, mm. it's, it's really hard to say. Um, but if you, if you force me to, then yes, I would say right now, the best bet in town is the Metro Mayors. It doesn't work for everywhere because not everywhere fits that model. But, but you know, you could do that they are there, <coughs> they are doing a good job so far. Um, I think there is great. There are some great examples of cross-party working. It's, so far, they seem to have avoided the worst of the kind of political game playing that, that bedevils some levels yeah. of politics. I, I, I think going back to that question of process vote, the problem is we're asking the wrong question every single time. We're, we're asking what. You know, we really should be asking how and why. Yeah. You know, why are we talking to you about this, and, and how are we actually going to deliver it? So, so when we talk about that, like kind of consultation fatigue, and yes, every couple of years we, we send across. You know, probably the, the same thing we, we submitted a couple of years ago. Why are we doing that? But what do you actually want to see on the back of it? And, you know, if I, I would actually really like to receive, you know, just a negative response at some point, say, right, we, we've taken your ideas on board, we disagree with all of them, um, and this is why. Um, I mean, ideally, I prefer them to say, this is brilliant, we're going to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. But, but to actually just have a response uh, goes a long way, because that, at least that way, that there's a level of engagement and you know, it goes off into the ether, it disappears, and all of a sudden there's an idea that no one wants um, other than a consultant who says, that's what you need. Uh, whereas if you can have someone come back and say, well, no, it's, it's a good idea, it, it won't work because of X, Y, and Z, engage, it's not rocket science. I mean, I can talk to you about rocket science, uh, but you know, we- Can you? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah with, with, my, with, with my chemistry degree and, okay. and astrophysics, I probably can do. Um, but yeah, if we, we just need to engage properly, and we're just very, very poor at that at all levels of government, and you know, it, it goes back to how and why more than what. Can I just add one, oh, can I add one more you point? You can, yeah. yeah. Just one more point, I think, if you look at it on a local level and you look at some good practice, and, and poverty truth commissions are, are probably a good working example on a local level. So they bring civic and business leaders around the table with um, communities of, uh, who have expertise of an issue. And it's a, it's a, it's a process and it, and it takes time and it's about developing relation, relationships mm. and the key principles I identified earlier on. So, so there are some working practices on a local level that would suggest that this could be upscaled. And I think what we were asking today, it's about, you know, I used the example earlier on about debt deductions, and I said it's a way of like, if we demonstrate by doing and we show the positive outcomes, can it be replicated or scaled up? Or, you know what I mean? And uh, because I think Karina had mentioned it earlier on, it's in nobody's interest to continue as we are. And I think sometimes um, to then affect culture shift at a higher level, it's about demonstrating by doing first, isn't it? And using some smaller scale pilot type work in order to, to um, you know, bring forward the, the principles that are needed in order to do this. Thanks. Um, I think we had a question from the gentleman over here in the pinky tie. <laughs> Hi, it's um, Mark Haslam from <coughs> Step Change Debt Charity, um, and thanks, Tracy, for your work with us on the debt deductions report. Um, I guess my question is a little bit about institutions, but it's also tying into the um, point that Ryan was making earlier about accountability. Um, and Tracy, it was really interesting to hear what you had to say about poverty truth commissions. Um, it seems that um, in getting government or local government to, got to actually do things, you need to be able to tell a story convincingly and then unfortunately you have to keep on telling it again and again and again. Um, one of the ways that I've seen this done really effectively in London is the London Citizens Campaign, which is a kind of group of people of uh, different faith communities um, and none. And they have been really effective at kind of holding these very scripted moments, meetings at kind of key uh, moments in the electoral cycle, bringing politicians in front of them and kind of really holding their feet to the fire in a very scripted way. Um, and I wonder, I guess, I guess my question is, ar is around, you know, is there a room, is there a place for citizens' assemblies and things like the kind of Citizens UK, London Citizens Movement, and how do you keep on building like that? I mean, when it comes to deductions, um, you know, 
98% of people in step, that come to step change who have a deduction taken from them say it was unaffordable. 60% of them have to turn to crisis borrowing as a result. Uh, uh, debt is one of the huge things from this pandemic that we're not dealing with at the moment. You know, kind of COVID-related debt. No one had that in their household budgets for kind of 18 months worth of kind of massive disruption. I think we need to kind of be creating institutions that raise big issues like debt and kind of hold people's feet to the fire because it is it's a cross-government issue. Okay. Ryan, do you want to come back yeah. on that at all? Yeah. Um, so I am in favour of more citizens' conventions. Uh, I mean, I, at one point it was being proposed as a solution to the Brexit gridlock, which I disagreed with. Uh, you know, there was a massive referendum involving millions of people. That was the answer, and uh, it, sh it was to be delivered by government, quite rightly, in the end although I voted for Remain uh, initially. Well, I did vote for Remain. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, but I respect the democratic result. Um, I think what I think it's probably a more kind of abstract answer to your um, point. But I think the issue with politics, and not just being an MP, but the world of advocacy and think tanks and media is very informal. It's very based on informal relationships and networks. I remember when I graduated, I did not have a clue what a think tank was. And then I set one up like six, seven years later, but only because of the relations I, relationships I developed within politics. And I think when you have that informality, it does tend to favour people from uh, backgrounds, more middle class backgrounds, which are high in cultural capital and have very strong social networks. Um, and I think the importance of institution and institutions is, uh, and building institutions into certain processes is that it formalises things, which I think then does allow wider access uh, to people who maybe don't uh, are not kind of visible of entries into stuff. And that's why I think citizens' assemblies and building that more into the policy-making process is a kind of new institution which formalises stuff and I think then widens the um, uh, kind of type of people that you might get in it. I think the problem with politics generally, and, and it's not just about how you engage uh, with different communities in the policy making process, which we, I think you should do, but it's also the type of communities coming into the world of politics and making sure that that's widened. Uh, and you know, a lot of professions um, have been better at formalising entry routes into it, but the world of advocacy, think tanks, media still feels very informal, and as such, I think it's harder for people from lower income backgrounds to penetrate it. So I think just formalising things and building institutions into entry into politics, but also the policy making process within politics, I think is, is the answer. It's quite a kind of philosophical abstract answer to it, but I think that's probably trying to bring together what other people have said. I think that's probably my response to it. Okay. Is there anyone else on the panel? I mean, I'd just, just too concretely that while the kind of example of London citizens and their citizen assemblies I think is quite powerful as a campaigning tool, that, that's all it is and it is inherently limited as a result and that's not their fault because that's, that's what they are. Um, I think the real potential for that sort of model, and, and I think it is massive, is when the, the state itself actually starts embracing it properly. Um, and I think we, this is the, the time has come to be brave about this. You know, we, our politics is really quite broken in this regard. There's a, there's a horrible kind of level of distrust and kind of disdain in all directions in politics, both um, from, from the centre to kind of ordinary people and vice versa, right? I mean, the, the trust in politicians is at record low, so it's, it's, it's abysmal. Um, and that, that doesn't just breed kind of negative social consequences, it also just makes for bad policy making because no one, no one trusts anyone, no, everyone gets themselves into a position where they assume that, oh, um, you know, if, if those bastards just you know, listened to us then, then everything would work perfectly. And of course there are trade-offs, there are really difficult trade-offs to be made. And everyone will understa understand and gets that when they're engaged in the right process of decision making. But 99% of the time we're not, we're just, we're just expected to assume um, if I shout loud enough then the transaction will, will be rigged in my favour. And that's, you know, this is, this is a, this is a put it mildly, a rather poor way to do policy making. So I do think there's a huge opportunity for more deliberative processes and participatory processes, um, but we need the state to get behind that. Mm -hmm. And so far I see absolutely no indication, bluntly, from any of the political parties that they're prepared to do that. 
Um, are there any last questions? Um, okay, great. Uh, chap at the back. And you've got a question too? Uh, Maybe. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Tom McGrath from Good Things Foundation. We're a digital inclusion charity, and Tracy, we've worked together for a bit, so nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Just on Ryan's point, um, I wanted to say that I, I agree it's like frustrating for us as a charity that I've got more engagement with MPs over the past couple of weeks by just going up to them at the bar yeah. than mm -hmm. through emails and petitions and all that sort of stuff, uh, requests for meetings, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's frustrating. You'll get maybe like one in 20 coming back to you. And I, I know I've been a parliamentary assistant myself, so I know how busy inboxes are. But it's sad. My my question, I guess, for Karina and Tracy is: um, you mentioned about digital inclusion and digital divide could have been almost fixed at the start of um, the pandemic. What kind of things would you have liked to have seen the government do very early on? And like at this stage now, where we are, um, what would you like to see them do? Like, how would you like to see them engage now uh, to to fix it? If that's a I don't know if that's a good question or it's not. It's a good but, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So go back to the first point first, because I'm getting a bit tired now. So the first point was, what did I want the government to say first uh, off? Uh, so what could they have done would you like to see them do um, at the start, right at the start of the pandemic? And that's relating to digital inclusion, yeah. is yeah. that right? So at the start, we obviously worked on a local and a national level. So at the start, there was, I think, what we felt was a big assumption that everyone was connected. Yeah. Mm. And I think that was it. And even if they weren't connect, if they were connected, then they had the skills and the ability to navigate things. Mm -hmm. So then things that are as simple as your universal credit journal, when libraries were shut, when community centres were shut, all of that wasn't thought through straight away. Mm -hmm. Then obviously the, there was the issue around schooling and homeschooling and printing off things and, and, and a lot of things like that um, and, and navigating online type journals for schools. So that wasn't thought about and Karina brought that to light quite well earlier on. And then, and, and then there was another thing we saw straight away was the access to services, mental health services. You've talked a lot about that earlier on, you know, alcohol addiction services, all of this, all went straight away, just overnight. And there wasn't the thought through, was there like something as simple and traditional in, in the olden days, you know, when we used to have a leaflet, when we used to pick up the phone, you know what I mean? I, I, like my kids laugh at me, the grandkids will say like, carry a pigeon nanny, you know what I mean? But these methods of communication we seem to have been forgotten about. And I think what should the government should have done straight, or could have done if they'd anticipated, same as the local authority areas, was anticipated we needed to get communication out through different <coughs> mediums straight away. And then we also needed to think about, then there were also, then, then the government response when, you know, when we were getting the head around it and that, I guess, was, and, and this is just my perception on this, was free laptops to all, get a device into the home, do this, do that. But again, it didn't, it didn't, it, did, it neglected to consider that a lot of people didn't have confidence, you know what I mean, in doing that. So that, so that bit was missed as well. So I think again, it was about that. Let's talk to the community. We're digitally divided. How you did that in a pandemic when I, I had a guy who I used to work with didn't have a phone, couldn't go on his UC credit uh, claim permit, and, and that I, I had to end up going back to a letter through the door. Now that's time consuming. That's tiring, and that. Mm. But I think these are the things that needed to be think thought of straight away. And I don't know if I answered the second question. I'll answer the second Go on one. Then. Um, just, Go just in Hartlepool, there's been a really good initiative. I, I think the local authorities involved, but it's um, Hartlepool Action Lab, and they offered um, like cheaper broadband, but local broadband, um, which obviously employed local people, um, created jobs for local people to be more digitally included. So that was that was like a really good out, outcome for Hartlepool. One final thing on this, I'd be truly inspirational. You know what I would do if I was the government, this is me. If I was Prime Minister today, and I would have a conversation with the communities and local government and housing and things like that, and you know, new bills and, 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 and houses that are, are, are built in, in particular deprived areas or whatever. What, in, as part of like, you pay water, you pay sewerage, you pay everything else. Why isn't there some a basic level of internet in there? We, we say, don't we, like these days, um, you know, being connected, it's n it's it's not a luxury, it's a nece necessity yeah. in yeah. modern day life. Mm -hmm. oh. Was there just, I just, you, you, did you want to ask a question or not? Um, there's time. There is time, is it okay? You've already asked one, is that okay? Thanks very much. Okay.
I think this might have to be the last one as well before we mm. go to the, the woman here with blonde hair. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm Anna Thomas from the Institute for the Future of Work. Um, we're a charity and independent research and development institute. Um, I've really um, enjoyed the discussion about participation, but this question is a different, but I hope complementary one. Um, we've done some research about the correlation of access to good work across the country um, and its links to health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Um, looking at various indicators, including deaths of despair and diseases of despair, as well as COVID mortalities. And the results are quite striking. Um, and it led us to think that perhaps good work could be a guide and measure to a measure of success for levelling up. Um, I'd really welcome the views of all the panellists about how we can reboot the good work agenda and get it into the conversation about uh, levelling up. I might um, just get Christian to answer this one, if that's OK, in the time that we've got. Since this is your... Uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> it, in, in short, we've not learned lessons in what, 11 years of Marmot. Um, you know, we had a prime opportunity for that 10-year anniversary to, to revisit, uh, re refresh, if you will, and we didn't. Uh, so we, we keep on talking about all these fantastic strategies um, coming forward, and 18 months later, there's not a single pen that's been put to paper about any of them. And, uh, again, from, from my own perspective, you know, an alcohol strategy, an addiction strategy, where are they? Yeah, you know, I've been asking about them you know, in the chamber for 18 months now, nowhere near. Uh, so when you're talking about uh, illness and death by despair, you know, the, the research is there. Uh, you know, the, the recommendations are there. Uh, we just need to do something about it. And you know, whether that's from a, a public health perspective, from an education perspective, uh, we're just not doing it. We're, we're not having the conversations we, we should be doing. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the fact we're actually having to have this conversation now is something we should all be really, really depressed about because it's, again, it's not rocket science. You know, why, are, why are we not doing this? If, if we're talking about health inequalities, you know, opportunity, that is levelling up. If that's one thing we're taking away from a conference or from, from this government, that's what we really need to achieve. And I, I don't know, yeah, I, I think we're making the right direction, you know, the right noises, but the actual work in the background isn't actually there to support it. Um, so that needs, needs to change very, very quickly. Um, you know, we don't need to look a million miles away from here, whether it's you know, Blackpool, uh, whether it's Bradford, whether it's Radcliffe in my own constituency. You know, you know, everyone is better. You know, we, we know what the problems are, we're just not addressing them. So we, we need to do it very quickly. Toby, was there one, any final point on that one? Are you all done? We're no, all done. <laughs> 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 I, 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 but I'll be, I, I think I'll, I'll need to read your research because it sounds very interesting. Okay. Look, I'll just sum up really quickly. I know you'll probably uh, want to be dashing out the door, but um, we've had a really fantastic discussion. Thank you so much to um, all the panellists. I found that absolutely uh, fascinating. You know, we've been talking about how we get people's voice involved in levelling up. Um, Toby, you made some very compelling uh, arguments for devolution and the value of metro mayors as being one vehicle perhaps for getting people's voices more involved. Uh, Ryan, you said there could be uh, you know, valuable space for citizens groups in the right places. You were very vocal about um, early years education as well and how important it is to make sure that um, the youngest are getting um, the best quality education uh, that they can. Um, Christian, you, you've been great. Thanks so much for being. So, I think you're very frank and very honest. For maybe, <laughs> it's, it was really good to hear. You were also talking very strongly about um, arrogance, the cut to UC, and uh, you don't think that's the way forward at all. Um, and you also said that to have meaningful conversation, you need more MPs to come from a background, perhaps like you, or to, to have um, as much diversity as possible. And that way, you end up having a more genuine, meaningful conversation with constituents in turn, perhaps as well. Um, Tracy, um, thank you so much. You talked about the value of lived experience, but marrying that with expertise um, and that the two things together are extremely powerful. And you also made a bit of a call out to how you could be, um, how you could engage better with institutions. And I think if anyone wants to come and talk to Tracy at the end, she's here, she's come to do this panel, it might be a really good opportunity to do that. And Karina as well, you spoke very powerfully about um, the value of having a lived experience feed into policy making and discussions and you were very very good as well on digital um, inclusion mm. and how important it is to make sure that people have broadband and have it as a necessary uh, sort of skill and um, sorry a necessary tool in their lives so they can be fully engaged in society but thank you very much to everyone for, for